So welcome everybody. Oh, recording. Yes, great. Welcome everybody. Um, so happy to see all of you again. Um, and so excited to have this uh, steering committee meeting like right in the middle of the panel process. It feels like we've got a lot to, to potentially talk about today. Um, so as you saw, our agenda is pretty thin because you know I want to make lots of space for us to express thoughts and you know concerns, ideas about the process, how it's going so far, and and how it'll proceed. Um, so we're just going to do a quick round of inter introductions. So mostly to introduce our our new panelist for this week, uh, or our new member for this week, Robert. Um, and then we'll do a little, Lynn will give us a little process update and then we will have plenty of time for kind of open discussion. So let's just first, I know we've done this almost every time. So thank you for your um, uh, persistence in these introductions, but the uh, oversight task committee has approved this, this structure of having kind of, maybe you could describe this better Lynn or Robert, but two panelists, you know, in our meetings every time, but one overlapping and one rotating, one new person rotating in for each new meeting. Um, so maybe Robert, you could just say a tiny bit about yourself and then we'll do a quick round so you know who's in the room and then we'll we'll move into the process update. Okay, hey, uh, hi, um, I'm Robert. Thank you for welcoming me here. Um, I've been in technology for about 40 years. Uh, my jobs there have been varied from being a systems engineer to a chief technology officer. Uh, the tasks that I've uh, specialized in have been in the advanced engineering of software, which includes, uh, <laughs> dovetails to this committee, uh, process and service engineering, as well as the uh, innovative uh, brand engineering and creation, creation of software. Uh, as you know, software is very complex and uh, systems. Uh, these days I'm semi-retired, although now and then, uh, somebody needs some innovative process or uh, innovative service engineering, I get pulled back in every now and then. So that's, <laughs> that's what I do these days. Um, as far as the task um, representation here for the other panelists, uh, we decided to stagger on a two by two basis so that there'll always be somebody new, but in order to have continuity on, um, on the knowledge of the task force itself, uh, the task panel uh, or task committee, I should say, uh, we decided to stagger uh, the, uh, the presence here in this uh, committee. Great, thank you, Robert. You're welcome. Um, and let's just pass it around quickly here. Uh, Sophie, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Sophie McGinley. I'm an assistant planner with the City of Eugene Community Planning and Design, and I'm the public engagement lead for the Middle Housing Project. Welcome to our meeting, Robert. I'll pass it to Commissioner Fragla. There we go. Um, my name's Lisa Fragla, and I am a member of the City of Eugene Planning Commissioner. Um, in my day job, I'm a second grade teacher. Great. How about Ken? Uh, Ken Beeson, Eugene Planning Commission. I'll, uh, I'll pass it to Heather. I'm Heather Salicki. I'm a member of the Human Rights Commission, and my day job is White Bird Clinic. Pass it to uh, uh, Jennifer. So welcome, Robert. I am Jennifer Ye. I'm a city councilor for Ward 4, which is Northeast Eugene. And my day job is I work at the Lane County History Museum. How about Ed? Welcome to the panel, Robert. Ed McMahon, I'm the executive director of the Home Builders Association. Let's pass it on to Carolyn. Hi, I'm Carolyn Jacobs. I am the representative for the neighborhood Leaders Council, which is a group of, or comprised of somebody representative from each of the 23 neighborhoods in the city of Eugene. Terry. 
Hi, Robert and everyone. I'm Terry Harding. I'm the principal planner for the city of Eugene, managing the city's work on House Bill 2001. That's my day job. In my not day job, I'm a mom of 13 year old twin girls who are trying to learn from home, which is an adventure. I'll pass it to Karin. Hi, everyone. Karin Knutson. I'm an architect and urban designer based here in Lane County also homeschooling two children in the elementary ages. It's a great adventure right now. Um, <laughs> and uh, I am also the founding director of Better Housing Together and on the faculty in the architecture and planning departments at the University of Oregon. Um, and it's a pleasure to be a part of this steering committee. Great, thanks everybody. I think you know who Lynn is, Robert. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Um, so great, let's move right out right into the process update from Lynn. And um, Lynn, if it's possible to just take till 120 still, that would be great, but yeah. but what do you need to do? No, no, fair enough, absolutely. And um, I just talked to Linda, I believe she's coming on in just a moment. So um, Robert, you and Linda, I'll give you a chance to to say whatever you'd like about the process so far here after I've sort of done the, the nuts and boltsy kind of stuff. So let's do the nuts and bolts first though. Here's this update. Uh, we're in the middle of phase two. Um, as you remember, there's sort of three phases to this fall section, two phases to the spring section. Um, so we're in the middle of this section where this phase where the panel has selected stakeholders and experts to come present and have heard from one of them. We're gonna hear from a whole bunch more uh, coming up in the next two sessions. Um, ah, yes, there we are. I wanted to spend most time, uh, most of the time showing you a little diagram of sort of where, where we're going. We're right uh, between sessions four and five right now. Um, so the panel has done its, its sort of two rounds of selection um, using the menu that you provided, also um, entertaining uh, any additional folks uh, off the menu. I think that the folks selected were all from the menu, if I remember right, um, though. Um, and there will be a sort of uh, final gaps analysis coming up on um, Tuesday uh, to see sort of where, you know, now that we've heard a bunch of stuff from, from uh, a bunch of folks that we've selected previously from folks who the steering committee selected, um, you know, are we missing, are we still missing anything else before we kind of close the door on the information gathering section? Um, I've done this in two sort of two pieces here, the green phase two and the, and the blue phase three. Um, and as you'll notice, I'd sort of set out that, that outline previously um, as a strict separation. <laughs> you know, four, five, and six are phase two and seven, eight, nine are phase three. Um, I'm hoping with your permission that we can bleed those together just a little bit, um, partly because um, it's, it, it's, it's sort of uh, important to, to sort of start working with principles a little bit, not just kind of push that till the very end, but also um, maybe most urgently that there are already a couple of folks that Sarah Giles, the expert liaison, has contacted who can't make it until December 1st session. So hoping that uh, we can, can sort of uh, feather those, those together a little bit so we can get those folks in. Um, and then sort of at the same time here, um, oh, I should mention, so sort of in this stage, the, there's two, as you remember, there's seven, five different task committees. And the two that are most active right now are the rec uh, recording and summarizing task committees, one for panelist expertise and one for outside expertise. And um, as you see down there in the bottom, the, there's sort of exploration of, of panelist expertise still, still continuing, did some of that on Tuesday, and um, we'll continue that uh, a little bit here. Um, and at the same time that there's a lot of folks uh, coming in to, to present still. Um, so sort of the, I wanna point out the milestones here. Um, you noted sort of the gaps analysis there, um, the, the sort of end of the information gathering phase here. And then at the very end, the, the sort of final prioritization, um, but that's skipping ahead here in phase three. Um, the, summer, the summarizing committee's work will sort of come together 
to provide uh, a basis, whether it be a report out to the, to the panel and utilization of that of those that sort of summary work um, for for the purposes of identifying potential principles. Um, and then as soon as potential principles are identified, then kind of we're moving into the drafting task committee, taking a lead role in, in helping to sort of wordsmith some of those principles even fairly early on in their development. Um, however, there's a lot of work to be done that final three sessions where the principles will be organized. Um, uh, well, what's missing in there is, is drafted. That's sort of happening throughout in, in iterative groups. Um, and then uh, prioritize and with rationales attached. So, um, and, and I should say there's no, uh, the, the drafting group is, is, and is, is like all the other subcommittees, a, um, a sort of staff resource to the panel. Um, that is that they're taking content that's been created through iterative group process and, and then just helping to to get the words a little bit better, not creating things from scratch within that one committee. Um, that's, that's important. And throughout the drafting process and then throughout the, the um, which, is, which is intermixed with the organizing process, um, those will be done in sort of iterative small groups, as I mentioned, which means um, working sometimes with a little bit of individual work time, sometimes in pairs, sometimes in small groups, reshuffling small groups randomly um, and overlapping small groups, in fact, uh, is one thing that we may do um, so that there is sort of institutional continuity from one group to the next, um, but also new voices. And then always coming back to check with the full group and then going back into small groups again, that kind of back and forth. So that's what's gonna be happening a lot in those last three sessions. Um, I think I'll leave this on screen and let me pass it over to Robert or Linda, if you're here, um, to say any words about, I've sort of talked about where we're headed. Um, would you like to say any words about sort of where we are right now or where we've been or how you're feeling about the process? Go ahead, Robert. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was deferring to you, but... Uh... Yeah, I think the process is very familiar to me having been, uh, well, I've lived this thing for, lived process for 40 years. Um, that's part of and parcel of my career. But um, yeah, the, uh, I think the iterative process that I'm seeing, the continuity among teams and task committees, uh, I think is very, very good. You get different perspectives and you get to gather a lot of that information uh, through, um, through, well, filtration, basically, you, fil you filter it down. I do have a few thoughts about the process. One is that uh, since the target has to be, um, well, has not literally has to be, but mostly deliberative, uh, is it possible for us to change the presenter format where um, the presenter can pre-record the presentation uh, so that uh, we can view it, me speaking as a as a panelist now, so that I can see it offline and I could have more detail and a longer uh, presentation at that. And then to round it off, perhaps the presenter can be given, I don't know, two minutes perhaps to recap this in, during the actual, um, actual session. And then you actually then have a longer time to deliberate and ask questions, which seems to, to drive a lot of the meetings. Um, so that's one. Um, I know the process is iterative, so um, if you have an iterative process, then the earlier you get the, uh, the outcome, uh, in this case principles, in uh, develop, I think would be a lot better. So my thought is that if you have principles that need to be delivered, then uh, perhaps push that uh, gathering, if you will, of a, a bulk before it's refined further uh, earlier in the process than later. Um, let me see. Um, my last thought was really more a, as a panelist. How do we test the propriety or the, the correctness of the guiding principles that I or we as a, as a panelist group will come up? How do we know that it is correct and it's right and it's appropriate for Eugene? Uh, I do not 
do not and have not heard of uh, a singular test that would prove that. Uh, so I was looking more along the lines of coming from technology and putting my tech hat on. Uh, do we have an alpha and a beta for this to test the appropriateness and who will test that? So those are my thoughts. Those were very good questions and thoughts, Robert. Thank you, Linda. Um, I just want to say as a panelist, when we break out into um, when we break out into rooms with people that we haven't been with before in groups, at first it's kind of intimidating until um, until one or two people start a conversation. But at the beginning, it seems like we just sit there until someone says something. That's all I wanted to share. Thank you. I, I feel that way. Uh, and our sort of non-directive kind of moderation style probably probably doesn't help that. It leaves quite a bit of silent space <laughs> to be filled, but hopefully uh, it gets more comfortable over time. Um, let me share my screen again. Um, uh, and, and Robert, uh, good, good points on um, uh, yeah, all around. On that second one, the sort of uh, getting into the principles a little bit sooner is sort of my part of the thinking behind kind of feathering these two phases together instead of kind of a, a super linear approach um, like I had laid it out before. Um, and I would love to get the rest of the of the committee's thoughts on on this process stuff or or anything else that that Robert or Linda said. Did you want to do kind of a discussion of this diagram first, Lynn, before opening up a bigger discussion, or is that? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to just, well, first of all, just the very practical thing. I wanted to see if there were any um, objections to sort of feathering phase two and phase three a little bit together on session six and seven, like I've diagrammed here. I have my hand raised, but I'm not sure if you can see me because we're in presenter view. So, and no need to change. This is Karin. Um, I just, I was looking for the raise hand feature and couldn't find it. Um, so I don't have any objections to feathering the two. I, I do think though that puts um, an additional burden on you all as the facilitators of this process to make sure that any new information is incorporated into any thoughts or decisions that happen perceiving that information arriving, right? So it adds actually an extra cycle potentially to your principles development process. You'd have to go back and confirm that, you know, what was learned after beginning that process, you know, doesn't, isn't generative or is generative. Um, and if that can be folded in uh, effectively, I think, you know, it gives the, the panel the best chance of using their time well and, and then reflecting, you know, what they hear in a few of those later um, presentations. I was struggling, Lynn, I have to say I was struggling a little bit to track as you were explaining this diagram to us, the schedule, um, and, and probably for really basic reasons, like I would be really careful to be sure that this diagram, that you're speaking the same words that are on the diagram for the different sort of categories. And even if that means more clearly labeling you know, phase three, like doubling just the color indication and the phase, and then using the same heading, I think that will help other people who are trying to follow along with this. Um, and then I would be careful about diving into, you know, the description of, of cyclical process within each of these arrows while you're walking through it. Um, and I don't know if you're sharing this with others, you know, beyond our group, but those, those were thoughts that came to mind for me. I wasn't, um, quite clear how the task groups that you described fit into this and, and sort of where they their work lived. Um, and it sounded like, and this is a question, that the task groups are generating draft principles and then those draft principles are going to the full group for discussion. Is that accurate? Uh, sorry. Yeah, no, I know it's confusing because it's kind of different kinds of groups here. And, and sorry if I didn't lay this out as well as I could have. Mm -hmm. um, 
good, good comments uh, for the future. Um, so yeah, there's sort of two different kinds of groups and randomly selected small groups are who will be doing the content, the, the primary content work, um, including uh, identifying um, principles or principal ideas and doing a first sort of pass at principles. The drafting group is is an editing group, really. It should be it should be called a wordsmithing group. I think was the other word we used. So they're taking taking concepts that have come out of the the randomized and iterative process, and and helping to refine the words rather than doing content work. Um, and who's generating the content then? Is that in the? That's the iterative small groups here. So that's that's so that's what I was sort of talking about. Um, that we typically you sort of go from smaller groups to larger groups to to the full group to back down again to smaller groups to back up to the larger group again um, in, a, in a sort of back and forth kind of process like that. Mm -hmm. um, so and and the reason why it's important to do those in in randomized groups rather than task committees is the task committees were self selected into based on people's um, you know, interest and skills in in those areas. So the drafting group may not be representative of the or reflective of the whole panel, but if we do a sort of randomized and iterative process, then we can get closer to, to that. And the other place where, so the drafting group is kind of, is this proof, or I don't know what to, editing, let's call them editing group, maybe that's a better a better description. Whereas the summarizing group is is sort of in the earlier stages, just trying to, everybody is is maybe taking notes or, or sort of thinking about the information coming in, but the summarizing group is sort of helping to put some pieces together and 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 create some yeah summary of of what's come in from outside versus what's come in from the panel itself okay i'm, I'm i want to keep going i don't <laughs> but i do think that um finding language that people can visualize and track clearly and understand the differences between groups responsibilities will be probably important because this will be referenced again. And if the difference is between a summarizing committee and a wordsmithing committee, it'll people will not know what we're talking about. <laughs> Those are my thoughts. Yeah, let me know if you have, you have ideas of how I should do that better. But I, I take your point. It's it's hard to for me to think of how to describe, but yeah. I've uh, switched my screen so I can see everybody now. So feel free to raise your hand or just speak up. Yeah, um, this is Terry. I can't see myself, but um, just a thought based on Karin's comments and questions. Maybe what would help accompany this diagram is a, a structure diagram or something that shows the different groups actually as mm -hmm. things. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got the whole panel, you've got, and you, we could explain also the steering committee, which I think is an important part of the flow diagram, and then how the different committees um, nest into that. That's a, that's a great point, yeah. Uh, an organization diagram. Any other kind of direct feedback about um, moving the principles? Back, back a session or up a session, I suppose. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here, this sort of confusing diagram. And, uh, and, and I guess we, uh, yeah, any other discussions we can use the rest of the time here for Alex? Yeah, yeah, so before, um, like I said, our, most of the rest of our time will just be for open discussion, but I wanted to very quickly here, just um, for reference before we get into that, just share, remind us of our working agreements, but specifically um, also, yeah, we can refresh on the agreements there um, and specifically the decision-making structure. Um, so just in case this comes up, uh, you know, in this conversation, today, remembering that we're striving for consensus minus one. Um, but if there's kind of a big proposal that gets generated today, then um, we've we've made this space for ourselves to kind of fall back on a, on a voting majority um, system if, if there is kind of 
a proposal for a change and, you know, or the status quo. Um, we can use voting if need be. And then <clears throat> prioritization is how we've done, you know, the menu, menu creation and um, expert selection so far. So just a quick reminder on that. And um, now I'd love to just open it up for, for conversation. What are folks um, feeling? What are observations, concerns, thoughts about of how the process is going so far and, and where we're headed from here. I see Sophie's hand. Thanks, Alex. Um, for everyone that wasn't um, or didn't observe the last meeting that we had on Tuesday um, or hasn't looked at the list of uh, prioritization for the experts that the panelists themselves chose, would you mind sharing that? Um, just so folks can get an idea of what the next few sessions are going to look like and who will be speaking. Yeah, sure. So we did that in a couple different phases. Um, as, as probably you all know, we did some on Saturday and some on Tuesday. So those were the two documents that I sent out in email. And I can, um, I'll pull those up and share them. If a couple people want to make comments in the meantime, it'll just take me a sec to get them up. I had one small related question, which was just for a list of the experts that have spoken to the panel to date. If, the, if you could just run through those, because now I can't, I'm not even sure how many panel meetings have happened. Lynn, would you be able to do that as I get these, these documents up? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, let me just pull that up as well here. Um, so we've had, we've had four panel meetings so far, four, four sessions, three last week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and one on Tuesday. Um, the first three sessions, as you know, were stocked with folks from the top of your prioritization list um, in the first sort of background expert round um, earlier on. And uh, it's going to take me a second to, to pull up those names uh, as well. I saw Ethan from uh, Ethan Stuckmeyer from LC, DLCD and Alyssa Hansen from the city of Eugene in one of the panel sessions I was able to watch. I think that might have been the first session. Yeah, that was our first. <laughs> I think that so. was in a couple of parts. Yes. I think I saw Renee Cloth on that one too. Okay. So here's all the here's the names on the project website at healthydemocracy.org slash Eugene. If you just go down to the documents section, you'll okay. see the presenters with everybody that provided slides. Um, there's slides linked from here as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the first panel selected presenter was Michael Anderson from Sightline, uh, who was able to be scheduled on Tuesday. Uh, was the only person from that first round, first round of panel selection on Saturday, who was able to be scheduled in such short time. So, um, those other folks um, will be scheduled in these remaining times, plus the the folks that were selected on Tuesday as well. I'm ready to share the other ones if, um, unless there are any more questions or comments about the presenters that have already been. I have a question, it's for Linda and Robert. How do you all feel like the panel is engaging with or, you know, taking in the feedback from the experts so far? Um, I think for the most part in the in the uh, subgroups that I have sat in, um, there is a uh, an underlying theme of uh, we need more information. Uh, personally, I, I find myself uh, in a quandary looking for more data about uh, certain uh, certain specific things. Um, uh, demographics is a, is a big thing for me because <clears throat> uh, tacit uh, into this process is the is that we're 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 creating little housing okay and uh, my question is how do you perpetuate that 
over time? How do you keep middle housing present in, in the economy? And there are various forces that interact with, uh, with, with this, real estate, uh, financing, um, ownership, migration, and all that. And uh, so far, I have not seen uh, a, a lot of that in the presentation. So overall, with among the panelists, and Linda was uh, part of uh, my original group also, uh, who can speak to that, um, I think there's a feeling that uh, the, the information we're getting is too summarized, perhaps, uh, and that there are more questions that can only be asked after further deliberation, you know, a day three to, you know, a day or two or three or a week after, and, uh, you know, when you've digested the, uh, the presentation. Linda? Well, I am learning as we're going along. And um, I don't know if you know, but Robert is, he has engineering in his background. So he is putting, trying to put the puzzle together. I, on the other hand, uh, worked in the uh, school system. So I am learning. That's it. Thank you both. I see uh, Jennifer, Lisa, and then we'll go to Carolyn. Yeah, so that's really great feedback, actually. So maybe this question is for Lynn. Is there something in the process where questions can come from the panelists, somehow get answered by someone, and then come back? Yes. So uh, Robert had a, a, a few notes uh, of data that, that he was interested in. And first of all, uh, if any panelists want to do their own research and provide data to the rest of the panel, there's a mechanism for that. Um, but but uh, I sent, sent that uh, list over to, to the city, to Terry and Sophie, and um, they said, well, actually one of the speakers who's sort of on the list um, may be able to speak to those quite well. And so we sort of went back and forth with Robert and said, uh, and said well, let's, let's hold on, see if that person ends up getting selected by the panel. They sort of seem to be on the short list right now. So, um, and they were selected on Tuesday, I believe. Um, so, uh, and have been scheduled um, for uh, that first uh, day in December, you know, pending this conversation today, but it seems like nobody has objections to that. So um, they're, they're one of the two people that were sort of only available that day in December. So, um, but yes, questions like that, um, I will forward, continue to forward on to the city in case someone can, or, or forward on to whoever has an, it seems to, you know, might, might have an answer to something like that or encourage the panelists to do their own research. So when people, so if a panelist brings their own research, how, did, how does that, does it have to be like an original source or is it just, I read this thing somewhere and... Right, so it's submitted via a form on the, on the internal panelist page, uh, password protected page, and each panelist, um, nobody has done it yet, but um, everybody is welcome to submit any additional sources. Um, one per panelist per phase is sort of what we've gone for right now because um, it can be, uh, there, there's a, there is potentially a problem with overwhelming with information. That said, um, you know, the panel uh, can choose to change that or you can choose to change that. Um, how information comes into the process is something that's always open to negotiation. I think it's, it's a balance between what, what is um, sort of enough uh, openings for information versus sort of what is kind of opening the floodgates to information in a way that could give preferential access to people who have time or ability to, to get information into the process one way or another. That's kind of a balance. And then I know we had two on deck, but I also don't wanna lose this request um, from Karin to put the selection up. So I think I'll just share my screen and then um, we can just have that to look at uh, while, while Lisa, Karin, or no, Lisa, Carolyn, and then I saw Karin's hand. Um, And this is just from um, 
from Saturday. Feel free to either read this for a moment or um, Lisa, you're welcome to jump in. Oops, I'll make it smaller. And just as a point of clarification, this is just sort of the first few names that were selected on Saturday, the names in pink being the ones that were the final selection. Blue and green were sort of runners up, um, but may have come back into the process on Tuesday when more, more names were selected. I can show those as well. Yeah, so yeah, and I, I can um, share the, the document from the second round of selection too. I also sent those out to everybody this morning. So if you wanna look in your email, you'll be able to see both pages at once. Um, but Lisa, Lisa, did you still have a comment? Yeah, and, and just for what you're showing us right now, I actually found the one that gave the final summary of the selection process to be the most useful um, in terms of what you're putting up. Um, I, I just wanted to say um, that, uh, so when I joined the Planning Commission, um, you know, I'm a second grade teacher. I am not an expert in this field. And I've learned a ton since being on the planning commission for three years, but I believe there's real value in hearing from um, gen the general public, right? Sometimes we use the phrase everyday people, right? We want to hear from everyday people about what they think in this process. And um, I think it's really important that uh, the panel's well informed, but I also um, would hope that people don't feel like they they have to have the pressure to be experts in order to provide input. And so I I, I would love to hear how, like what's been communicated to the panel in terms of their role in you know the larger role of this group in the public input process around HB 2001 because there is also a broader public input process correct should be mm -hmm. i think that's a, maybe a question for sophie yeah i think um, lynn could better answer the first part of that question but there there absolutely is opportunities for um, broader public engagement outside of hospital 2001 um, we you know we're holding a variety of roundtables and that's just the beginning um, and then this next phase you know after we get um, you know the direction from the state of what our parameters are for um, complying with the bill we're going to have technical concepts ready and that's when we're going to go out to the general public and you know ask them what they think so we have a variety of methods scheduled um, you know one is a survey we're going to develop things we're calling meetings in a box um, for folks to uh, interact with and so that is absolutely a goal is um, you know folks outside of this you know these structured meetings and processes and I'm happy to expand on that later um, but would like to defer to Lynn for that first part. Yeah, so uh, I, th I think we've tried to make it as clear. R Robert and Linda can tell us how well we've done with this uh, or not, but, um, but we are trying to sort of, um, to sort of make panelist expertise and experience a, a part right along side by side uh, the sort of outside expertise um, and experience. Um, and we'll continue to do that um, sort of in a very intentional way on Saturday um, and then uh, well possibly on Tuesday as well it's sort of that's like that's something that will get mixed in um, and complement the the presenters still pending how many presenters there are on any particular day um, so that's we're sort of uh, given the the other time to to panelist experience as much as possible but yes very extremely valuable we we are in complete agreement, obviously, that 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 everyday folks is is that that is the center of of all of this. So, yeah. And I just um just because I think it's hard to conversate authentically when we have uh, screens shared constantly, 
Um, I just shared the links that are from the um, public web page of, of both of the results of our, our two prioritization processes in the chat. Um, so let's go to Carolyn next. Okay, thanks. Um, so the very first presentation, or the very first um, panel meeting, you showed a, um, a video on bias, which I thought was really good. Probably should be shown more places, more times. But then as I watched the meetings, I started to sort of wonder like, how do the panelists know what these various presenters' biases are? How can they even guess? I mean, we list them up there and we say, you know, why this person is qualified or why we recommend them. But I don't see that the panelist has any way to know or even to figure out what someone, especially if they know nothing about land use or House Bill 21 or the city or anything, how do they know what these various people's biases might be? And how do they know even with, if what's being presented is actually true? I mean, I've listened to several of these people who obviously they know their stuff, they're, you know, it's what they do for a living, but I've heard statements which I'd say, wow, that's really some sort of exaggeration of the truth based on what I know. And, it, and it's from, it's not any one of the presenters, it could be anyone, but I just worry about, because there's always the risk, I mean, or there always is some sort of transfer of bias, right? It was actually built into the, I think that little video where if the person is presented in glowing terms, they're an authority, this is their, their work, and they have some sort of bias, which maybe everybody has some different bias, but you present some sort of bias if the, if the panel is accepting them as authority because we recommended them, then some of that bias that was just, you know, in deep into their presentation becomes absorbed. There's a transfer of that bias. So now the panel or, or whoever it resonates with, some panel members now pick up that bias. Anyways, so just, just something I've been worrying over or contemplating over a lot, because I just, I just don't see how, it, even though, I mean, we've recommended these people, I just don't understand how the panel can, you know, has, that, has any way to even be aware of, to judge, to take into consideration anybody's bias. And so they never know whether, okay, we've got a great range of biases. That's great, right? It's very helpful. We've got a little of all kinds of people, all kinds of organizations, but they don't, they don't know that. They don't know if you know 90% of the people presenting have the same bias or whether they've got you know, a wide cross section of biases. Um, anyways, I just, it, it's, it seems to be some sort of weakness in the process for me or something I can't quite resolve it. I mean, if anyone wants to speak to it, that would be great. I see Robert's hand. Uh, this is not quite an answer to Carolyn's statement, but also um, more a general uh, observation and a general perspective. I think, I think uh, the process has been sound and good uh, thus far as I have experienced as a panelist. Uh, I think the uh, team has done a very, very good job. For, for most part, uh, in, when I've done this in the past, um, we sometimes intentionally keep parts of the process. Um, we, we keep it blind so that you don't have an opinion bias going in into a process. Having said that, there's also part where and parcel where I think uh, we see a lot of the white hats, quote unquote, to use a uh, technology term, but we also don't, we also need to hear from the gray hats and the black hats. Uh, in, in, in simple terms, these are the people who agree, uh, somewhat agree, and do not agree with, with what you're doing so that you get an objective view and you get to form your opinion on how uh, to move forward. Uh, this is 
this is very rampant in technology. We, we use it all the time. Uh, it's hard to, to hear a, a contradicting uh, opinion. And it's also hard to, uh, to sometimes dissuade somebody from an established opinion. But unless you, you eliminate that bias and not knowing the process, um, you really cannot help it. I, I think, anyway, it's my experience. But uh, yeah, I, I would, um, in a way, this seems to be self-correcting in that the panelists get to choose and recommend a panel, uh, a, a presenter themselves. So somebody could uh, ostensibly promote somebody with a black hat or a gray hat or a white hat and, uh, and, and move forward from there, so. Can I just respond to that? Um, don't forget, I mean, we should never forget that the people um, offered to you on a list of possible presenters came from a steering committee. Mm -hmm. And we are as guilty of having biases as the people I'm taught, as you know, your potential speakers. So you might ask what the biases, what our biases are, because it's possible that we've given you you know, 90% of, you know, of the people names we've offered all carry the same bias because they carry the bias of the steering committee or not. But anyways, I just want to say that, that the idea of bias wasn't meant to just be the speakers and what you absorb from them, but there's definitely a bias built into the steering committee as well. You might question that. Thanks, Carolyn. And I see your hand, Karen. I just wanted to address one um, clarifying piece here, because I think a couple people might have had questions about it in the chat. Um, the two documents that I sent in the email and just shared with you all again, those are both final. So we didn't do, we, we did a, a first pass at the full list on Saturday that resulted in five names who Sarah started calling. And then on Tuesday, we went back to the full list. And, and the final from Tuesday is, is a new batch of, of names that Sarah will be in touch with. So, so that isn't like stages of the process. Those are both um, final drafts. Um, so Karen, go ahead. I, just, I, I think I had thoughts as well about that conversation. And one, I guess, perspective that I'll offer is I, I agree that it would be helpful to incorporate, um, and maybe this is to Robert's point earlier, an ability for the committee to you know, double back on its assumptions based on what it's heard from panelists, right? Um, and that that I think speaks to some of what Carolyn was just addressing about concerns with bias. I also think that there's a part of this process that um, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see how it plays out, right? We've never uh, tried to have this kind of representative conversation about housing and, and planning for housing in our community. It's historically been driven um, with, you know, the appropriate structural formally required processes, right, as laid out by law, but is um, typically able then through that um, burden that it places on people only engaging a very few number of people. And the few people usually engaged are people who already own their homes and are happy with everything being the way that, you know, they bought in, right? Um, and I think that the thing that is really interesting about this process is we have a different cross-section of people offering thoughts about what community housing needs are and how we, uh, you know, manage those while still having a place that we all love. And I think it's gonna feel uncomfortable at certain points to see a process be more democratic, democratically representative because it won't be familiar to us. And that's a big bias, right? I want, I want what is familiar and I want what feels comfortable to me. Those two things um, in terms of, you know, kind of where we, where we live in our own hearts. So I think it's, I hope that Lynn and um, Sophie and Terry and Alex, Alex, you're taking kind of this, this feedback to heart. And the, the last thing I'll say, I'm sorry to go on, is that um, for Robert and Linda especially, because this steering committee is populated, I think, from pretty 
different perspectives around uh, the need and, and the desire of having more housing options and um, more affordability of housing options in our existing um, neighborhoods, you know, that there is a wide range of, of expert perspectives coming to you on that list. If it was coming just from me, it would be different. Coming just from uh, Lisa, I'm sure it would be different, right? Um, but you're getting, I, I think, a cross-section of perspectives, at least at this point, that um, makes me appropriately uncomfortable, right? <laughs> it is not a whole, a whole group of people who are in lockstep with what they think you know, the world should be. And just from seeing who is coming in the future, you're gonna hear, uh, I think, some you know, pretty wide ranges of, of feedback on housing need and, and the um, role of, of this law in meeting it. So those are my thoughts. Erin, and I saw Terry's hand earlier, and I just want to be mindful of time. We've got about seven minutes. Alex, Ken had used the raise hand feature a few minutes before Terry. Sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, and I just wanted to say we've got a few minutes here, and if there's anything that you know you you really want on Lynn's mind and my mind um, as we continue to go through the process, since we don't have a meeting next week this is very much the time to um, make sure we know what we need to know. So uh, Ken and then Terry. Okay, thanks. I'll try to be brief. Um, I appreciate all the discussion I've heard. I guess I've, I've tried to keep up with this as best I can. I think I've seen everything except Michael Anderson. Uh, I feel like I'm pretty well caught up. I had some, some questions about the process as we were moving into it over the last couple of weeks. And I found as I've watched the panel sessions, I, I find myself getting a bit more comfortable. I understand being uncomfortable. I think it's still pretty not at all clear to me uh, where it's going to go. But I find myself curious and interested and open. Um, having said all of that, a couple of kind of recurring reactions I've had all the way through. And I, I really think you guys are doing a good job. I like, I kind of like the way this has been set up. I like the way you've got it organized and how the discussions go and all of that. Um, I, I just find myself, the first four sessions I think have been about getting people grounded and helping people understand kind of the foundation of this is, is, has been my impression from all the material. And um, I think they've been good. I've, I've found myself wanting them to have just a little more time. And I completely, and, and I kind of heard echoes of that from Robert. And I understand as you set these up, you've got to stay within time and you want the meetings done on time and so on. So I get all that. I just find myself with several of the speakers thinking, gosh, I sure wish I could have heard some more from them. And it's like they had more. Um, I had a little bit of the same thing for when we've been able to hear the panelists ask questions and the panelists talk. I'm really thirsty and hungry for that because I, I know I can't be part of the small group discussions, but I'm always curious what's going on in there. Uh, so I think any, to the extent that there is a way as we go forward with presenters to have give them any more time and any more time for the panelists to ask questions. So that's just kind of some comments and reactions after after three or four sessions. Thanks. Thank you, Ken, the constant struggle. <laughs> uh, Terry. Thank you. I'll keep it super brief. I just wanted to throw in um, a statement to the effect of what's guiding my participation in this steering committee as staff. And I point to the public involvement plan that was approved by the Planning Commission. So if you haven't read that, it's worth looking at. It's our guiding document for all of the public engagement being done for House Bill 2001. And it has a focus on equity and inclusion. And so I just wanted to provide that as a document that you could look to for what um, values and approaches were proposed by staff and ultimately approved by the Planning Commission. I think I saw um, Carolyn's hand first and then uh, Lisa, you'll probably have the final word. Okay, I just had a quick question. Is the, and this sort of raised the 
re, uh, relates to a lot of people's comments, but I'm wondering, is there, would there be any means that this, or the steering committee could come up with a means that anyone from the general public could provide any amount of comments or information to panelists? Just wondering if that's, it doesn't exist now, but it, um, several people actually have asked me about that. Is there a way they could comment? And I, I don't know. Um, they have asked us several times if we have had any meaningful conversations with friends or neighbors regarding this subject. So I believe that is um, the opportunity to share just what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Lynn, do you want to respond directly to that as well? Yeah, I was just going to say that that's uh, no, that wasn't wasn't built in as an aspect of this particular process, but is always something that's that's on the table and and would be a, a process element uh, for the steering committee to to consider if you wanted to introduce something like that. Okay, well, I guess I'm I'm suggesting that that might be a useful thing that the somebody in the public could send info or comments to the, especially if you've been watching all along, you might want to send something to the whole panel. I don't know what the proper procedure to move something like that forward or to make that happen. Don't know. So, so yeah, um, that would, I think that would be a process that this group would need to kind of form a proposal around and, and decide how that might happen. Seeing as it's coming up right at the tail end of our meeting here, I'm not sure how to do that in a way that that you know makes sure everybody's voice is involved in kind of developing that proposal and um doesn't quite feel like we would have the space right now to make a vote but i'm open to ideas about how to move forward with our decision making process um in the in the time that we have if anyone has a suggestion yeah lisa keep forgetting to unmute myself, sorry. Um, considering there's not even one minute left, I would say that we table that and have a discussion about it at another time so that we can use a group process around it. Um, but I did just quickly wanna go back to the comment that I wanted to make before, which was um, my comment earlier was really about the, the power of our democracy and the confidence that I personally have in non-experts in our community members to provide informed, authentic um, feedback. And I think that's part of what is happening here. And so I just wanted to say, I trust the members of this panel to be intelligent enough and informed enough and savvy enough to understand that there's bias and to evaluate the range of presenters that they're, they're seeing. And it, it's great to hear from Robert and Linda and it sounds like it's going well. And I think it's important as a steering committee that we trust in the process. And I'm also excited to see what the outcome is. Great, thanks. I think that's a, an excellent final note and uh, we will see you all back here in, in two weeks. Thank, Thank you. you all. Two weeks, not next week? Next week is Thanksgiving. Oh, darn. Yeah. Right, we're not <laughs> gonna spend Thanksgiving together. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Bye, everyone.